All right, well, welcome everybody. I see people are still logging in, but I want to go ahead and get started and welcome you all here today. I'm Martha Shapiro, and I'm the Director of Programs here at Senior Concerns. So thank you for joining our seminar series today. Um, we're so happy to have you. Today's seminar is called Meeting the Challenges of Solo Aging, What You Need to Know to Be Prepared. And this is a very popular topic, so we, I know we have a big audience out there today, um, but we can't see you. We are in webinar mode today. So you'll notice when you logged in, you are in um, listen and view only mode. So that means that if you have any sort of questions for us, there is a Q&A box. So if you put your cursor on your screen, hopefully you can see Q&A. And you can click there to write in any questions for our panelists today. So feel free to write in those questions as they pop into your head. I don't want you to forget them. Um, but we just might not address questions until the end of the presentation. Also at the bottom of your screen, there should be a chat box. And that is a great way if you have any technical difficulties or anything that you need to let me know, you can type it into that chat box and then I will see it. So we're happy to have you today. Um, I just wanted to let you know if you're not as familiar with Senior Concerns, we're a 45-year-old nonprofit located here in Thousand Oaks. We run the Meals on Wheels program for Thousand Oaks and Newbury Park. We also normally run an adult day program. We're paused at the moment, but we're still offering some Zoom activities um, that you are welcome to participate in. We have set up a volunteer grocery shopping service and an emergency food pantry for seniors that are needing to stay home and be safe during the COVID pandemic. We also have a wonderful caregiver support center with caregiver support groups every Friday over Zoom. So if you're caring for an older adult, you are welcome to join us. Um, we also have our senior advocates and they take phone calls every day. We, they're here to answer your questions about resources, benefits, anything that comes up, we are here for you. So please reach out. We are recording this seminar. So in just a few days, it will be available on the Senior Concerns website. If you go to our website, you can learn all about our programs. And we have some new exciting programs coming up as well. We are developing a new brain fitness program called Think Fit. And that will be provided over Zoom right now. Um, and you can learn all about it on our website. And this is an evidenced form, ev evidence informed, excuse me, brain fitness program for your mind and body. It takes into the whole body into account. So um, please look at our website for more. If you go to seniorconcerns.org backslash seminars, you can see all of our upcoming seminars and click the link to register. And you can also view all of our past recorded seminars. So all of that will be um, available to you. So I am so happy to start our presentation today and introduce our wonderful speakers. We have Katie Wiltfong, who's a medical social worker, and Dr. Sarah Zeff Geber, here to talk with you today about how to meet the challenges of solo aging. So I'm going to start by introducing Dr. Sarah Zeff Geber. She's a recent recipient of the 2018 Influencers in Aging designation by PBS's Next Avenue. She's an author, certified retirement coach, and professional speaker on retirement and aging. Dr. Geber is the author of the 2018 book Essential Retirement Planning for Solo Agers, a Retirement and Aging Roadmap for Singles and Childless Adults. This book was selected as a Best Book on Aging Well by the Wall Street Journal. Sarah is also a regular contributor to Forbes.com on the topics of aging and retirement. A solo ager herself, Sarah lives with her husband in Santa Rosa, California, and through the benefits of Zoom, she can be with us here today without having to travel at all. So thank you so much, Dr. Geber, for joining us today. I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Martha. And uh, rather than having you look at me, I'm going to show you some of um, some slides and I'm going to talk through them. And again, I want to reiterate what Martha said. If you have questions, please feel free to post them in the Q&A box. 
And we will, Katie and I will both uh, be responding to your questions after we get done with our presentations. So let me get started on mine. All right. So uh, let me just mention what I believe is the good definition of a, a solo wager. Initially, I defined solo wager as anyone who did not have children, because I looked around me and I saw that what was going on primarily is adult children, especially adult daughters, taking care of their parents in their 80s and 90s and helping them out where they uh, needed some help with their activities of daily living or helping them move into a, um, a senior housing environment, just helping with all kinds of things. So I thought, you know, those of us, and I am a solo ager, uh, those of us who don't have children are gonna have to figure this out for ourselves. As I started talking about this, I got a lot of feedback from people, much of which was around my definition. And people were telling me right and left that just because a person has children doesn't mean they may not end up, doesn't mean they're gonna end up with those children being able to help them. So a lot of people have, have shared with me that they feel like a solo wager because their son or daughter lives 9,000 miles away or they're estranged for some reason. Um, it, any number of reasons why people can feel like a solo ager. So at this point, I've just said, if you feel like a solo ager, then you should plan like one because if you plan like a solo ager, you're on the right track no matter what you do. So let me start by talking about where our happiness comes from. Because after all, that's what we're trying to attain in later life. We want to be happy. Yes, we want to be safe and secure, and we want to figure things out for ourselves uh, while there's while we still can. Um, but we, we also want to be happy. And because the gist of what I'm going to talk about has to do with building community and the importance of having a social network and a community around you, I think it's pretty important to pay attention to this chart. Now, this was a study that was done about 15 years ago by a well-respected organization, and they went out and asked several thousand people who were over 60 what it was that made them happy at this point in their lives. And what they got was a very interesting lineup that I think would have been very different had they asked the set of millennials what made them happy. But as you can see, the two top sources of happiness for people over 60 are relationships. Relationships with family and relationship with friends and the friendships that they have. <clears throat> More important than any of these other items on the list. So again, it gives, it gives me ammunition, it gives me fuel for my thinking that what we ought to focus on primarily later in life are relationships. If we look at our natural social network, what we have is a series of connections. Now, this is a representation of a typical social network of a parent, somebody who has children. And as we get older, those children have children of their own. And pretty soon, we not only have a network that involves our children, but it involves our grandchildren. It probably involves in-laws. It involves children's friends. The network of a parent has the potential to grow exponentially. And I've watched this among my friends that do have children. I've watched this network grow, and it is pretty amazing. Now, it's not the same for everyone. Everyone has a unique social network, but this is a typical one for parents that have a good relationship with their kids and are now getting to have uh, quite a good relationship and a grown up relationship with grandchildren and maybe even great grandchildren eventually. It differs a lot from what we see as a typical social network for a solo ager. Now notice where the heavier lines are and where the lighter lines are. So, a, solo agers may have very strong ties to their siblings, especially if those siblings live close by, and also some ties to nieces. And again, so much depends on the proximity to which you live to these family members. 
So it's not that solo agers don't have any family, although some solo agers actually don't. But most solo agers have a few family members that they are thinking they're probably going to hopefully get closer to as they get older, again, especially if they live nearby. But it's also a wonderful time, this time period in your 60s and 70s, to start, if you haven't already, really cultivating healthy relationships with nieces and nephews, because these may be the people that you will want to have in your, on your team of support system in your social network as you get older. So as solo agers, we also have, in many cases, a more robust connection with our friends and with our community than parents do. We've had time to do that. We've had money to do that. We haven't had kids to put through college. Uh, we haven't had family obligations. And the draw to be more participative with our friends and our community has been stronger often for solo agers. So the point here really is that we all need to pay attention to where our social network is coming from. Who's in your social network? Could you draw a chart like this, putting names to the people that you're close to that you may be able to form a connection with for your social network as you get older? I just can't say enough about how critical social support networks are to a successful later life. We've heard a lot in the last few months about avoiding isolation and how perilous isolation is. We've seen it in senior communities where family members haven't been able to visit. We've seen it in people who are living alone and are un unable to get out and socialize, unable to see the people that make their life complete. So, it's given us a really good glimpse into what can happen to all of us as we get older if we don't have a social network, that a social support network that we can rely on and that we're, and that we're part of other people's social support networks as well. So all of these are, these bulleted items are ways that you can develop your social network. I'm going to talk a lot about what are the options for where you might live. Uh, very important to understand what your transportation options are as you get older. <laughs> Notice that one of my bullet points is getting a dog. I have a friend who, whose social support network consists almost entirely of the people she knows from the dog park. Once she got her dog, she started going to the dog park regularly and she developed a tight knit set of friends and they not only meet at the dog park, but at least before COVID, they were going out to dinner together, they were going to movies together, they were having socials, they were just doing all kinds of things with one another. They were a social support network to one another. They're still making that work to some extent during COVID, but they'll be back at it once this is in the rear view mirror. So it, the point is that you never really know where your social support network can come from, and it can come from so many different sources. Um, for a lot of people, their social support network comes from their place of worship. And quite a number of, of people, solo agers especially, go back to a church or a synagogue that they might not have stepped through the door of for 40 years. Why do they do it? Not so much because they've found religion later in life, but because they know that it's a place of social support. And I've never run into a church or synagogue yet or heard of one that did not have social programs for all of their members, no matter how old. And I end up doing a lot of presentations at churches and, and synagogues because they have older adult support groups and they and among them quite a number of solo agers so again there's lots of ways that you can develop and nurture your social support network and it's so important to do that at this point in life so what about 
housing. Where should solo agers live as they get older? Well, there's no one right answer for everyone, but I want to take some time to review some of the options that are out there and to help you kind of get a handle on, on what there is and what you might want to explore. So you're probably very familiar with the conventional living models for older adults. There are the 55 plus communities where there's really no services, but you have to be 55 to live there. There are continuing care or also called life care communities that you move into as an independent. And as you need more care, it's available to you at the same, at the, in the same community. These are expensive, but for people that can afford them, they're often a great option, especially for solo agers. And then stepping up the level of care again, there are assisted living communities where there is help available for activities of daily living, meals are provided, and all of the support systems that you need to stay, help to stay well and to stay mobile are available in assisted living communities, as well as board and care homes. Now, assisted living communities and board and care homes often offer the same level of care, but they're different, they're different look and feel. I have one uh, very good friend whose parents went into, happily went into an assisted living community when they were in their 90s and discovered they were miserable there. So she and her sisters got busy and found a lovely board and care home with only five other residents. They moved in there and they were very, very happy for the next four years of their lives. They lived in a, a small board and care home. So it's different strokes for different folks. Some of you have probably seen this with your own parents already. And finally, skilled nursing facilities. Those are the ones that offer medical care 24-7, most people don't need that. So one of the reasons why it's important to know about all these other options and the ones I'm going to talk about in a few minutes are so that you don't ever end up in a skilled nursing facility unless you really do need 24-7 medical care. So what are the alternatives? Well, we've got NORCs. That stands for Naturally Occurring Retirement Community. We see these in urban areas, as you can see on the, on the picture on the right, and we see them in the suburbs and in more rural areas, often in the form of uh, mobile home parks. I'm a big fan of mobile home parks because they can be terrific naturally occurring retirement communities. And what makes a NORC a NORC is that people have been living together as neighbors for many, many years and often that means that they're now aging together. So in the cases of some NARCs, they've even shared some care. They've shared the, uh, the hiring of an aide to come in to spend a few hours a day visiting each of them. It's really only limited by the creativity of the people in the NARC. Beyond NARCs, there's shared housing. And this is becoming much more popular as the baby boomers get older. This is, these two women are um, real life home mates. I like that term better than housemates. Um, one of them had a home that was too big for her and the other one needed a place to live. And they found each other through Silver Nest, a, a kind of a, a home mate matching service. And they've been together now for somewhere between two and three years. Shared housing is a wonderful option for people that are open to it. And I, I really encourage people to think long and hard about it, especially if you're in a position where you have a home to share or you would be happy living in a home with someone as a companion. Do you have to love that person immediately? Can you expect to love that person immediately? No. But you know, Love and companionship and caring grows over time. And for those who are patient and willing to put the time in and be open to the ways of other people, it can be a very, very rewarding way to not have to grow old in your own home all by yourself. I'm really a non-fan of aging in place alone for solo agers. There's so many, so many viable options. And shared housing is only one of them. So I have one more to talk about, and that's co-housing. Uh, 
I'm not, again, I'm not going to go into great lengths about any of these, but co-housing uh, started in Denmark actually about 35 years ago. And it's been around this country for well over 20 years. There's probably between 250 and 300 co-housing communities around the U.S. They are a grassroots effort, a group of people who want to live together. They either take over an apartment building or a, an old hotel, or in many cases, as you see in the picture here, they actually have a structure built for them. It takes on the appearance of little cottages or uh, condominiums, but it's an opportunity for people to live in close proximity to one another, have their own space, but also have shared spaces that they utilize on a regular basis. So if you want to learn more about co-housing, there's a wonderful website, cohousing.com, that will tell you lots, lots more than we have time for here. So this is probably, this is my final slide, um, other than to tell you more about who I am and how to get my book. Um, but this is probably one of the most important slides that I have, and it has on it some of the most important information for, for solo agers to pay attention to. How would you figure out what you needed to provide for yourself? Well, sometimes looking at what typical adult children do for their aging parents gives us a good window into what are the kinds of things we have to prepare for for ourselves. All of these areas are areas that you may, as you get older, need help with. Typically, people as they age do need help with these things. You may have helped your own parents with some of these things. So I know that Katie is going to talk a lot about how to plan for your own care. So I'm not gonna go into too much of this, but I did want to give you the option of seeing this pie chart because it's, it's got it's got the information on it that we all ought to be paying attention to as, as we make our plans. So at this point, I'm going to, I see there are a couple of questions in the Q&A, but I am going to wait until later because I don't want to, um, I don't want Katie to miss any of her time. So I'm going to stop sharing my slide and turn it over to Katie now. Well, thank you so much. Um, that is so helpful and really gets our mind thinking about all the different areas of functioning and living and quality of life that we need to think about. Um, so now I'm going to introduce Katie Wiltfong. She is a medical social worker with a master's in social work from the University of Southern California. Katie has a background in hospice care and has worked the last several years for Buena Vista Hospice Home Health and Palliative Care. Through her experience working with older adults and those facing terminal illness, Katie co-founded Solo Aging Solutions, a company dedicated to providing informed healthcare decision-making to clients when they are no longer able to do so for themselves. So thank you so much, Katie, for being with us. And now I have to get to Katie's picture. That's weird. I can't. Oh, there we go. Now, now everybody sees Katie, hopefully. Okay, thank you, Katie. And then, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you, Martha. Um, as Martha said, I am a medical social worker, and my background is in helping folks with home health and hospice. And throughout the years, I have been asked if I would step in and be someone's power of attorney for health care. And so I have started... Um, a company to address that needs of solo agers um, because I've noticed that there is there is a real need for us to recognize the importance of our health care and our health as we age and the need to have someone who we can have step in to take on that task for us. So I love the slide that Sarah provided us. I think it really simplifies and really addresses the main areas for solo agers as they look into what different needs they'll need to focus on as they age. Um, advanced planning is definitely one of the ways that you can help have some sense of control and some voice 
as you develop needs that adjust your lifestyle, your financial situation, geographical areas, and other factors that are really important to your happiness. So today I'm going to be covering some of the main information in regards to advanced healthcare directives and also planning for future decline because unfortunately aging is inevitable and as solo agers there needs to be a little bit more of a stressor on having someone who can assist you with these needs so that you can stay as independent as possible. And I think a big part of that that also Sarah touched on was the need to really build a tribe and really have that support network that kind of helps ensure that you have people that are going to be there to support you along this journey and in the next phases of life. COVID-19, unfortunately, I think has made many of us more aware of the need to look into our social networks and understand the need to have that level of support um, as life throws us some curveballs like 2020 did that we didn't know were to come. So in advanced healthcare directives for solo agers, this would typically be an area that adult children would assist with. So for most people, when I meet with them, maybe on the home health or hospice arena, they say, oh, I have a daughter, I have three children, and typically it can go to your next of kin. But if you're a solo ager, it's really important more than ever to really evaluate who you have in your life that can take on this role and to see who you really want to step in that you can have feel comfortable um, knowing what your views and what your decisions would be if you were unable to speak for yourself. A lot of um, estate planning attorneys say that this is the most important part of estate planning because in terms of your financial situation, um, setting up a trust, setting up a will, a lot of that is a little bit more black and white in terms of what your financial status is. And healthcare is very gray. We really can't fully plan for what's to come. Um, for finances, there is typically fiduciaries trustees, CPAs, there is um, a large network of people that can step in and really manage your financial needs if you're unable. And I think equally important is really focusing on who would step in and assist with your health care. Um, and because it's really important to assessing who your what your values are, what your goals are for your health and making that plan for the future. So some of the things to consider when you are not typically automatically looking at a child to step in this role is really to see if someone is younger than you, are they in good health? A lot of the time I have met with people who have a 98 year old sister who lives in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And after maybe a hospitalization, they say, oh, unfortunately, this isn't gonna be the best next step for me. This person is not gonna be able to respond to my needs because they have their own health concerns. And so it's very important to make sure that you have someone who is going to be capable of stepping in this role for you. Another important question is, are they geographically close or easily accessible? So for instance, you might have a nephew who's a brain surgeon, and while he has a wealth of knowledge and feels very comfortable in medical settings, he might not be accessible. So it's definitely important to assess who you have and if they'd be able to respond to you. It doesn't necessarily mean they need to live in the same city, but I think having someone that's available to you is very important. Would they follow your instructions and wishes? Um, that's really important to have that conversation and make sure that the person you're electing fully comprehends what your wishes are and that you feel that you're both on the same page. Um, would they be able to separate their own feelings from your wishes. So it might not necessarily be what they would want for themselves, but are they able to act in the same capacity that you would if you were not unable to make those decisions? Being comfortable in a hospital setting is very important. Some people, even people who do have adult children, tend to say, you know, that's just not something I want to be involved in. That's not something I want to make a decision about. And so that's a very important factor as well to make sure that they're fully comfortable having these discussions and that they would be comfortable advocating or asking for a second opinion. Unfortunately, we none of, none of us get out of this life alive. So are they comfortable with life and death? Are they comfortable having the discussion about hospice? 
would they be aware of maybe some changes in your health status that would lead to no longer pursuing treatment? And would they speak up and assert themselves to physicians? That's usually very important because in today's age, there's a lot of opinions, there's a lot of treatments, there's a lot of options that are given. And so it's very important to have someone who would be able to step in and really speak for you and know what you would want in that capacity. And some of the role of being a healthcare agent, someone that you would select on your advanced healthcare directive would be you know, requesting consultations, making sure that they're asking the right questions. Is this gonna prolong her life? What are the barriers that this might cause for her normal functioning? Making sure that you fully understand as the power of attorney what your friend or family member's wishes would be so that you feel comfortable and confident in your decisions because you would be consenting or abusing medical care based on what your discussions with that person would be. So this job holds immense responsibility and in the absence of having maybe an automatic adult child or maybe not having an adult child that would be comfortable or you would feel comfortable having in this role, it's definitely important to accept. I'm so sorry, Katie. I'm sorry to interrupt, but can you lean in a little when you talk because I just lost your audio. Oh, I'm so sorry. Is that better? That sounds better. Okay, perfect. Thank you. perfect. Um, another option is just staying informed of your medical decisions and conditions. And that's very important for them to really be aware of changes that may have happened. So for instance, someone who's maybe had some new diagnoses, it will be really important for the person stepping in as your healthcare agent to be aware of that, to know that there might be impending changes or decisions. Um, or things you've discussed with your physician because they will be your biggest advocate. Also very important that I tell all my clients is to really make sure that you're aware of your medical baseline and the person who's gonna step in for you to make medical decisions is aware of your baseline. And so by baseline, I mean someone who is going to be assisting with your physical I mean, someone who's going to be aware of your physical and cognitive status. So a lot of the time when we go into the hospital, we've had some changes in our condition. And unfortunately for older adults, oftentimes some confusion, delirium, exhaustion might be mistaken as typical age processes. It might be mistaken as a diagnosis that you might not have. Because there's many different diagnoses misdiagnoses that happen in older adults, whether it might be a urinary tract infection that can lead to confusion and agitation. It can be medications that can cause changes in your behavior. Fevers can ease and dehydration can easily affect us as we age. So I always like to talk to people about this because I think it's so important to make sure that we're not coming into the hospital and being overtreated or having physicians assume that there might be a dementia diagnosis, when in reality, there's just been a recent change in condition that really needs to be evaluated. So having the person who's stepping in to make your healthcare decisions for you know where your status is at is really important. And to kind of summarize what Sarah and I both talked about, this is um, some tips that I like to give to my clients just to make them fully grasp all the different areas because it can be very daunting to cover so many different avenues that um, might be, feel like they're kind of overclouding someone with so much going on and so many decisions to make as we enter later phases in life. So definitely staying active is of great importance. While aging is inevitable, exercise is really a powerful tool to really strive off cognitive decline and depression. Um, and it can also really be helpful in terms of mobility because falls are the leading cause of fractures and hospitalizations as we age. And so by being more mobile, we can prevent unnecessary trips to the ER. As Sarah mentioned, I am such a big proponent of socializing. As we age, our social networks automatically tend to shrink, unfortunately. And isolation can also be very detrimental to our mental health and our cognitive abilities. And so surrounding yourself with like-minded people can really help ease stress and help keep you in good spirits as you travel through different journeys in life. 
embracing interdependence is very important. We often try to kind of deny our limitations. We all, as humans, want to have as much independence as possible. And so by embracing interdependence, we can actually be aware of the need for necessary assistance that in turn can keep us independent. So having someone assist maybe with meal planning, like housekeeping, transportation, the little tasks we can do to keep ourselves from overburdening and maybe doing too much is so important. Also getting involved in the community is also a really great step of building your social network and keeping yourself involved. And being able to do the things, I think, as we have more time in retirement to engage in hobbies and volunteer experiences. Um, I know a lot of people in the community have stepped into senior concerns with the Meals on Wheels program. And I have heard from numerous people how much they felt a sense of community and a real sense of joy in giving back. And I think that definitely keeps us connected. And as this seminar really focused on was really planning ahead. Though the things that matter most to us are so individual and by looking ahead and really assessing your different options, you can really set up to make sure that your care, your housing, your lifestyle, your location, all the things that matter most to you are really taken into account. Being an active participant in your life, so looking into your own health and making sure that you're on top of your appointments, making sure that you're getting the routine physician appointments, eye exams, staying on top of your medication, uh, making sure that you are keeping track and speaking with your physician, I think really helps you make sure that you are engaged and involved with your own health because we are all our best advocate and having a physician that really steps in and can support you is of equal importance. You need to feel comfortable with your physician as the older we get, the more we go to the doctor. So having someone who can really explain to you maybe changes in your health and who you feel comfortable with asking questions and really speaking on what your wishes are can really help you feel more secure as things change. As I spoke about earlier, putting everything in writing is of great importance just to make sure that everything that you do desire and wish for is going to be recorded and followed because you've taken the necessary steps. And as Sarah spoke about, the importance of really looking into the different places to age. We're so lucky in Ventura County to have so many different resources, um, assisted livings, CCRCs, boarding cares, and skilled nursing. So in terms of finding the best fit for you, it really helps you feel more independent and uplifted and can really um, be emotionally uplifting if you take the time to really look into and see what matters most to you in terms of either aging in place or moving out into a facility. And lastly, completing your estate planning. So having a trustworthy person who can step in and make sure that your financial needs your estate and your healthcare needs are all put in writing so that you know you have that assurance that if you are unable to speak for yourself, someone can do that for you. Unfortunately, as we age, we're more susceptible to scams and I'm sure so many people are aware of all the different dangers out there. And so having someone in your back pocket that you can trust and rely on is really great importance. So I just wanted to end with just some local um, resources that we have in Ventura County. I utilize all of these being a social worker, first and foremost, Senior Concerns, who has so many different um, programs that Martha spoke about, Meals on Wheels, Case Management, Caregiver Support, so many educational series. Same with Ventura Area on Aging, the Global Center, which is in Thousand Oaks, um, which unfortunately is closed due to COVID, but has had a lot of different programs available through Zoom. Caneo Valley Village, which has a lot of support services in our community for local seniors to relate to each other. And also just having these important conversations, um, I encourage you to look at the Ventura County Coalition for Compassionate Care that can give you more information in terms of your advanced health care planning. So thank you so much for having me. And if you have any questions, we can answer them now. Well, thank you so much, Katie. Um, that was a lot of really great information about planning. And I just want to give a 
an extra plug for the concept of being more comfortable with interdependence, because I think that is something we all struggle with. We want to be independent, you know, independent, independent from the time we're children. And that's not always the best thing. It's okay to be comfortable allowing yourself to be more dependent on others because you would want them to do the same for you and, and it will be reciprocal. And there's nothing wrong with that, especially now we need to rely on each other more than ever. So that's something we all need to get more comfortable with. Um, I did have a request to show um, one of Sarah's slides. And so I had just pulled it up on my computer. so that I could share that. Um, somebody wanted to be able to view that. Can everybody see that now? Okay, good. Except that I just realized when I have it in that mode, I can't see the Q&A box. Well, why don't I share my screen? Okay, I stopped. Okay, because <laughs> I actually, That's so um, I actually neglected to go on to this next slide. <laughs> oh, I saw I didn't even show the slide they were probably asking for. <laughs> so, I hope, assumedly, this is the slide they're asking for. There's more information on everything that I said, and actually a, a little bit of what Katie said, too, is, is in my book, Essential Retirement Planning for Solo Agers. It's easy to get off of Amazon or any of the other online um, book uh, distributors. Um, and sometimes you can find it in your bookstores as well. But of course, who's going into a bookstore now? So order it online. It's not expensive. It's usually around twelve or thirteen dollars on Amazon. Um, there were a couple of questions that I think were aimed at me. Can I go ahead and answer those, Martha? Yes, but first, I'm realizing okay. that if you didn't show this screen before, then they were asking to see the one before. The one before. Okay, got it. Yep. Okay. So we'll, we'll get that one back up, and then, yes, if you um, saw some of the questions directed at you, then I will let you go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing, and then I'm going to start sharing again, because you probably want that. Um, okay. Uh, first of all, all right, I'm, I'm not going to share my screen right this second, because I have to pull up the... The, uh, the right set of slides to show you. So, um, so just sit tight because we will get that slide back up. And in the meantime, we'll start answering some of the questions. How's that? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, and yeah, I think probably that the slide that someone is looking for is that pie chart, that last slide that, that I did show. Okay, so we'll get that back up in a few minutes. Um, I, I had two questions. Um, the first is about a single parent of a mentally ill son that's, who is locked in a mental facility. Um, certainly that makes you a solo ager. And I, um, I hope that you have done whatever is necessary to create a trust um, for your son and, and um, gotten the help of a, um, an elder law or a state planning attorney um, someone like the uh, the people that Katie works with a lot. And if you haven't done that yet, I know that Katie can help you with that because she has strong ties to some really good um, estate planning um, attorneys. So that's that one. Um, and Martha, oh, did you want to say anything more about that? I think you just put that you were going to answer it live because you wanted me to answer it live. Yeah. And I think that what you were getting at before was you, it's hard for us to define for you what solo aging is. The key is really, if you think about it, that pie chart of what we think typically the children do for you. If you don't have somebody that's filling that role for whatever reason, then it's important to find other ways to make those plans for your future. Right, right, exactly. Um, okay. So the next question on here, if it's okay, I'll go ahead and read it. Yes. Um, she said, you mentioned that you aren't a fan of solo aging alone in your home. What about services that come to your home and help with shopping and et cetera? Are those not a good viable option if we want to stay at home? Yeah. Um, 
again, I'm not a fan of that because I think it is very, very isolating. Yes, you can buy all of the services that you need to come right to you. And that might seem appealing at this point in your life because you're not you're not confined to your home, except that we all are to some extent with COVID. Um, but those people will be your service providers. And do you really want that, them to be the only people you see on a day-to-day -day basis, people that you're paying to do things for you? For some people, the answer to that might be yes. Um, it certainly would not be for me. I think the value of having a community is so important. Now, remember too that there's a big gap between aging in place in your suburban home on a cul-de-sac somewhere where you drive in and out of your garage and you never see another person. There's a big difference between that and, and growing older in a condominium where you have neighbors right next door or a mobile home park where you have a community that's right there at your fingertips and you see them all the time because you have to go to the mail room to, and you see people there and you, you have to go fetch your car from the, the parking area. Um, and there are community centers and there are places where people can um, uh, get together much more easily than they can in, a, in the suburbs. So if you really value your privacy that dearly, then I would consider making the move to something more manageable than what you may live in now, um, and possibly looking into active adult communities where you are either renting or you own your own home. But again, you have services and you have opportunities to connect right there where you live. Thank you for that. Um, it's a good perspective because we do often hear so much that, you know, remaining in the home is the most important thing. And, and you bring a good point to that. It's not always the most important thing. Um, this next question I'm going to direct to Katie. Do you have an opinion on at what point or conditions warrant changing from a general medicine primary care physician to a geriatric physician? That's a great question. I typically have people who are around the age of 70 and a little bit older who start to make the switch to geriatricians. Um, typically it's a referral. Unfortunately, we don't have as many physicians speaking, um, working in this field. I wish we had more. I hope that we will have more. Uh, we're local in Ventura County. So you do have a few excellent physicians. And I think it's a really great step because they can really assess all your needs as you age. And, addition to any diagnoses that might come up. Um, they're also more well-versed in resources, which I think from both Sarah and my talking point are so important um, factors that are really important as you move into different phases of life and are looking into different areas. It would be really nice to have a physician that stands behind you. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and this next question is, what do you do if you have no living family? So we'll start with you, Sarah. Sure. Um, that is the case for some solo agers and uh, certainly does make you a solo ager. The, the answer to that can be, multi can be many fold um, and there are lots of options available to you. One thing that I don't think Katie or I mentioned is the existence of professional fiduciaries. And I am a big fan of professional fiduciaries. They're not lawyers, and they're not social workers. They are people who have been licensed to provide you with um, someone to be your decision maker, someone to step in and, and do what you cannot do. This is what they spend most of their time doing. They're far less expensive than attorneys and they can be engaged to do the kinds of things that your kids would do for you at, when you need that. Uh, what I suggest to solo agers is that they find a few fiduciaries in their area and interview them. And when you find somebody that you really like, that you resonate with, to talk to them about your future. And if you, obviously you have to have enough um, assets to be able to 
afford them when you need them because they're not going to cost you money up front, but they will have to get paid when you need their services. So if you have that, if you have enough of an estate that they can be paid at the end at the rate of about 100, $130, $150 an hour, again, far less than an attorney, these can be the people that can be just the angels for solo agers. And they have a professional society called PFAC, Professional, Professional Fiduciary Association of California. We are one of the only states that does certify and license fiduciaries. And again, I, I, would, certainly, I would certainly check that out. Thank you. Katie, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I absolutely think fiduciaries are a great option. You can also check with your CPA. Some CPAs do provide that service to clients. Um, and then I think this is also a really important role of looking into who's in your social network. So you might have people in your life, you might have a attorney as well that can step in to assist you. So I think it's really important to kind of look in and see who you trust and make sure that you do have someone in that, in that role. Thank you. Um, this question is how many CRCs are in Ventura County? And I'm assuming that's continuing care retirement facilities, communities, um, and if I'm correct, there are two. Katie, am I right about this? <laughs> yes, I think for Ventura County, because there is one in the Valley, San Fernando Valley, yeah. So the two would be um, University Village in Thousand Oaks, mm -hmm. and then Brookdale in Camarillo recently mm -hmm. got licensed as a continuing care facility. So that means that they have all levels of care within one community. Mm -hmm. And we're lucky, I think, in Ventura County that those two different CCRCs are very different price points and very different types of models. Mm -hmm. So I think both I encourage people to look into to really find the best fit. During, unfortunately, COVID times, it's a little bit harder to look into facilities and really assess what might be the right fit for you. Um, but I think looking into their medical capabilities um, is really important to, because some are more focused on a social model and some more on a medical model. And then I also always tell people, you know, look at the activities. In addition to looking at the food, make sure you like activities because some are so focused on the arts, some are very focused on different reading groups. And there's definitely people who have very strong feelings about what their hobbies are going to be when they move on to this phase in life. So I always say that that's a good avenue to look at. Yeah. And of course, outside, if you just step right outside of Ventura County and the counties around you, there are lots more. Mm -hmm. um, Southern California in general has tremendous number of CCRCs and life care communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, LA County, and then even if you move up towards the Santa Barbara County area. Um, somebody's asking, is there a way to get a dog or cat if your apartment building says no pet? <laughs> I think I know the answer, but I'll let you. Anyone want to answer? <laughs> It's not me. <laughs> so in my experience, um, some apartment buildings have special provisions if it's a service animal. Mm -hmm. um, so you can question about that and what is required to have an animal be registered as a service animal. And I think also there's service animals and then there's the emotional support animals. So I think those are the ones that you can probably get registered without having um, as much of a condition or diagnosis. I think service animals might be a little harder to come by too. So that might be a, an avenue where you could train an animal as a service dog. I'm sure that would be allowed. <laughs> yeah, so you can definitely ask the apartment and, and then there might be size restrictions as well. And it's worth moving for. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like you said, very important. Um, okay, so if you buy a house in a 55 plus community, do they let you install security cameras if you are a solo ager and need coverage when you leave home? Hmm, that's imagine. an interesting question. Yeah. I, would, I would think so. Um, it's your home. You're usually allowed, unless you are defacing the front of the house in, in any really visible way, there's usually quite a lot of leeway for things like that. It, it would be you know, it would differ from one community to the next. And I would certainly ask that question up front, but I would, I would bet that the answer will be yes. Mm -hmm. I would imagine so. And there just might be restrictions on where it can um, video, you know, what the 
fan of that for privacy, privacy. Yeah. for other people's privacy, which is mm -hmm. fair. Um, okay, now what about help when you are ready to get outside help in your home? Because this person has decided to age in their home. So in terms of resources for getting help in the home is what I'm, I'm guessing this is directed at. Um, so maybe Katie, do you wanna start? Yeah, there's definitely a lot of different avenues of getting help in their home. Um, definitely hiring of a companion type care. A lot of people are a little resistant to maybe bringing in someone they deem a caregiver if they don't feel they need more physical support. But a lot of the different wonderful agencies in our community have more companion level type cares. So someone who can assist with like housekeeping, transportation, and also provide some level of companionship. I think during these times are very important. Um, meal delivery is also really um, accessible and something that can really benefit. And I think it's really important when looking to assess help in the home, thinking what are the different avenues that can really relieve some stress, relieve some unnecessary energy that I'm putting out, whether it might be transportation, having another person in the home, meals, light housekeeping, anything that you can really feel is gonna keep you more independent. Absolutely. And if anybody is looking for those types of resources, then Senior Concerns, that's really what we're here for, um, is to help you understand what the local resources are and, and piece together a care plan that will really fill all of those needs in that slide that we're going to put back up again in a minute. <laughs> um, and then somebody else says, a challenge is finding trusted people who are younger when you have no children, nieces, or nephews. What do you suggest to help build a network of younger people? I, I'll start with that one. Um, you, there are so many different places to start. Um, it, I love anything that gets you out of doors. So hiking clubs, walking clubs, running clubs, um, book clubs. I, I, I belong to two book clubs and one of them has people that are all just about my age. But the other one has um, a really interesting age span of about 20 years. And, you know, it, I think it takes an ongoing group like that to build the kind of relationships that you'll want in order to feel comfortable asking someone, would you be part of my social network or my, my care team? Um, would you be comfortable being on my advanced health care director, would you be comfortable carrying my power of attorney? All of these are questions that you might ask that person. So you want to really develop a, um, a strong relationship with them. Um, the um, really almost any kind of or any kind of group you could think of, uh, meetups, for instance, are a wonderful source of meeting like minded people that you can develop friendships with and also your place of worship if you're involved with a church or a synagogue. Wonderful, thank you. Um, there's questions about PFAC. This is for fiduciaries. Um, is there a website for them or a phone number? It Just pfac.org, I believe. And you can certainly just use the search terms Professional Fiduciary Association and you will get to it. Okay, perfect. Um, yes, Sarah, if you want to go ahead and put that slide up because sure, that is something that's not quite working for me. Okay. Um, and then there was another question about the continuing care retirement communities. Um, how can we find out in how they are rated? Um, so the Ombudsman, Ventura County Ombudsman is wonderful in our mm -hmm. county. And they don't have ratings, but you can call them and tell them that you're considering moving. They offer pre-placement counseling um, so they can talk you through the different options. They can also let you know if there have been recent complaints against the facility and what type of complaints they are. Um, so I always recommend before officially selecting a facility to call the ombudsman. Okay, great. So we've got that slide up so people can Reference that and take their screenshots. Mm -hmm. Okay. I take um, it down. Now, you you want to leave it up a few more minutes. Okay. 
Is there a benefit to a healthy solo elderly person living alone in a neighborhood with mixed ages and mixing with different ages or better to live with like aged people? That's a good question. And boy, is that a different strokes for different folks answer. <laughs> because, you know, I, I have had people uh, tell me they would never want to live with quote unquote, a bunch of old people. Um, and I've had other people say, you know, I don't want to be bothered by all the, the noise and commotion and the priorities of, of middle-aged people and their kids. I'm just done with that. I want to, I want my peace and quiet and I want the, the, um, the ambiance of being surrounded by people of my own generation. And you know what? Everybody has to make that decision for themselves. Absolutely. Anything you wanted to add, Katie? I think definitely one of the pros of being in a, a more diverse age-wise neighborhood is that you can perhaps develop some of these relationships we talked about of having people who are younger and involved. Um, and I think that kind of will allow you to maybe explore different opportunities as well. Um, so I definitely see positives of that in terms of if you're trying to kind of build your own network. There certainly are trends with the baby boomers toward more opportunities to have multiple generations, at least around you. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot, it's some really interesting things are going on in the senior housing community. A lot of senior housing is being built adjacent to universities, mm -hmm. adjacent to, especially in urban centers, um, adjacent to childcare centers, adjacent to schools, which, which, which just offers a cornucopia of opportunities for people to give back, to tutor, to be um, a surrogate grandparent. So, you know, I, I certainly would, would check out the options that are there. And it's, again, it's, it's pretty easy to do. The, um, the, uh, let's see, the American Senior Housing Association, ASHA, A-S-H-A, -S -S -A, has put together a wonderful website uh, for consumers. And it goes through a, a lot more detail on which kinds of senior housing are available and what they provide. And, um, you know, some, I think, tied to a great number of examples. So I would encourage you to check that out as well. It's the American Senior Housing Association, ASHA. Okay, so many great resources and so many acronyms. <laughs> yeah. We'll try to keep track of them all. Um, I have a question about if, a, if you're living alone, is a cell phone sufficient in case you have a medical emergency? And then another question that was asking about your thoughts on first alert necklaces. So I think those kind of go together um, with what do we need to keep ourselves safe if we're alone? So thankfully, a lot of the personal emergency response systems do work for cell phones. Um, so they have made those a little more adaptable as a lot of us don't have landlines anymore. Um, when looking into the personal response systems, I definitely suggest making sure that it has fall detection and is waterproof. Because historically, a lot of these devices had to be taken off in the shower where most falls happened, and they were reliant on you being able to hit the button. And so they've adapted them. Um, Philips Lifeline has a great one, a company called Great Call who also has a senior cell phone, also makes a fantastic one. Um, and I, I really recommend those to people to make sure that they really ensure that if something is to happen and you're not able to actually push it, that those are the ones that are a little more um, reliable. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I think safety is definitely one of the key things to think about if you do live alone. So that's a really important topic. Um, I know that it's five, but we have a couple more questions, so if it's okay, we'll just keep going to answer a few more before we wrap up. Um, so somebody's asking more specifically to talk about the difference between University Village and Brookdale, um, and I might refer that one to the Ombudsman's Office, if that's okay, um, to get some more specific information on how they run their programs. Um, another question is, what are resources for someone who doesn't have a lot of money? That's a very good question. And I always get it. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the best resource for you 
if you don't have a lot of money, are like-minded people. Get together with your friends and figure it out together. Um, be each other's source of support. That's the best thing you can do. Live together if possible. Um, if you don't have a lot of money, one great way to save money is to live with other people. You know, rent or I, I don't know if, if one of your friends may have a large home that they could take take other people into and, and build a community that way. Um, you may be able to rent a large home for two or three or four of you. It's so important to have other human beings around you. And if you're, you know you're not destined to live in a, um, in a senior housing community because you're just never gonna be able to afford it, then it's a do-it-yourself deal. Um, I also usually mention that the world doesn't stop at our borders. Of course, right now it does, but <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of much less expensive opportunities to grow older in a community outside of the United States. Certainly outside of California, it's a lot, uh, a lot cheaper. Um, uh, but, you know, going south of the border into Mexico and some of Central America, there are some wonderful expat communities where people who have never had enough money to uh, do anything in the United States have found a great deal of happiness and companionship. So I would check out all of that, whatever's appealing to you. If you have friends in other parts of the U.S. that um, it's just so phenomenally cheaper to live outside of California. It's, of course, I don't know, after this year, it might not be true anymore. <laughs> I happen to live up near the fires, so. <laughs> and I just would like to add some of the resources that I had at the end of my slides. Um, Senior Concerns definitely is who I refer back to a lot of the time because they do offer assistance from social workers. They do have attorneys that dedicate, um, donate their time to assist with looking into different questions that people might have. They have great support groups. Um, the Conejo Valley Village to Village is also a really affordable option to really create that social network of people checking in and being able to assist with little household needs. And in turn, you can find ways for yourself to give back. Um, I think we have a lot of really good resources in Ventura County. I think we're very grateful to live where we do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and then I'm going to end with the last question today, which is sort of two questions I'm going to merge together, which is that um, some people, once they move into assisted living, they express that they wish they could go back and live at home again. Um, and then the same question about does moving into a facility like an assisted living cause you to go more downhill? So um, I'll ask each of you to comment on that. Um, perhaps, mm -hmm. Katie, you can start. Yeah, that's really an interesting question. I've personally seen almost the opposite of that situation where I do see a lot of people who have said to me, I wish I had moved in sooner because I'm able to take part in a lot of activities. I'm not having to deal with my own meal preparation. I'm not having to keep up with my own home. Um, so I think for a lot of people when they make that step and they find the, the real community that fits for them, it can really alleviate a lot of stressors on them. Another really great option, and it depends on each person's financial situation, is there's often no contract in some of these facilities. So you can do a test run. And I have had people who have moved in for a month and said, but I don't know, this might not be permanent. I haven't had anyone move out. So I kind of encourage people to really take time to make sure that it's going to be the best fit. And then to never feel that you're stuck. If nothing is black and white, you are not ever stuck in one place. You can always find the best fit for you. Yeah, I, I certainly agree with everything Katie said. If you remember my story about the the um, the friend who moved her parents uh, into an assisted living community and they hated it. And so she and her sisters were able to move them back out and into a board and care home, which was much more to their liking. It was small, it was personal, it was homey. They saw the same people every day. And that's, that's what made them comfortable. So again, it, it's to kind of assess where you might feel the most comfortable before you take the leap. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, thank you so much to Katie and Sarah for sharing your time and your expertise with us. Um, it's so valuable and we really appreciate it. If I didn't get to your question or there's something else that pops up, 
you are welcome to um, shoot me an email or call us at Senior Concerns, and then we can follow up with the appropriate person and get you the information you need. Our next seminar um, that we're hosting will be on Tuesday, September 8th, also at 4 p.m. You can go on our website to register. It is called Creating a COVID-19 Backup Plan, What to Do if You or Your Loved One Becomes Ill. And I think it's an appropriate follow-up to some of the topics we've talked about today, about how can you have that care plan in place in case you need extra help. So please go on our website and look for that. Um, I want to thank our speakers again and thank all of you in the audience for joining us. I hope that you have a wonderful Tuesday evening. Thank you. Thank you.